Good morning and uh, happy Halloween to everyone. I don't think I see anyone in a costume out there, but I'm sure uh, we'll see one uh, later today. Uh, my boss, Arnold de Borgraf, sitting in the front row here with me and I, and the rest of us at CSIS, welcome you to our new headquarters. It's our first event for our project in the new building, uh, which opened just a few weeks ago. My name is Tom Sanderson. I co-direct the Transnational Threats Project with Arnold de Borgraf who began the program in 1991 as the Global Organized Crime Project. We shifted after 9-11 to take into greater account the uh, threat of Al-Qaeda and, and related um, entities. We are very, very happy to inaugurate our new Transnational Threats Roundtable series with the author Moises Naim. No one better for this, uh, this roundtable series to launch a look in an investigation, a deeper investigation into transnational threats. The book, you see it right here, The End of Power, is Moises' 11th book, which lays out the dynamic, unyielding impact of transnational actors on traditional power structures. You might be familiar with another book that Moises wrote that gained wide, widespread fame called Illicit, which looked at the extensive impact of illicit commerce and its impact on society. Before I'd start, I'd like to uh, thank Dick O'Neill, who's also in the front row here with us, who brought us together. And uh, so very, very fortunate for that. So thank you, Dick. Today's discussion will begin with 15 minutes by Moises on the book, why he wrote it, what he learned from it, what he thinks the lessons are for a range of audiences. I'll then turn to um, three to four questions that I have already um, uh, created to generate some more discussion and detail on the book, and then um, we'll open it up to audience Q&A. But let me first tell you a few things about this very remarkable man and author. Moises Naim is an internationally syndicated columnist and the best-selling author of more than 10 influential books, including this 11th one, The End of Power, a startling examination of how power is changing across all levels of society. As his experience proves, Moises is a true student of global affairs. He's served as a cabinet member in Venezuela and as the executive director of the World Bank. He gained international recognition for his 14-year tenure as editor of Foreign Policy Magazine, which I think probably everyone in this room has accessed over the years. He's also a respected scholar right up the street at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. With a unique perspective on world affairs, he is one of the few individuals who truly keeps ahead of the curve in the rapidly changing grounds of global politics, economics, and business. If you listen to the Diane Reem Show on Friday morning, the, the news roundup from 10 to 11 is the international hour. I think Moises is on there every other uh, Friday, and that really is a testament to his uh, perspective on the world. The new book, End of Power, reflects his ability to, ability to spot, describe, and analyze a new global reality. Through his analysis, we gain a better understanding of what's happening in everything from telecommunications to the Arab Spring. As a columnist, thinker, and author, Moises has received prestigious international awards and, perhaps not surprisingly for a global citizen, is the media's go-to person for instant foreign policy commentary in English, Spanish, and Italian. His remarkable description of power in the world today is acclaimed by top leaders, including former President Bill Clinton and businessman and philanthropist George Soros. This book, The End of Power, will change the way you see the world, the individual, community, and government power structures for decades to come. Please welcome our global thinker who will guide us through this groundbreaking idea in the face of changing power, Moises Naim. Thank, thanks for the kind introduction. Uh, what a building. Thank uh, you, thank you. Congratulations, uh, CSIS. Great. And uh, I want to st start by thanking Arnaud de Burgraf, uh, not for inviting me today here only, but I wrote a book titled Illicit uh, that was about transnational crime. And uh, when you do something like that, you recognize who the pioneers are and who are you plagiarizing. And so um, Arnaud is a pioneer that saw these uh, trends before everyone else and understood them and dissected them and explained them better than anybody else. So I want to take the opportunity to recognize you. Uh, and Dick O'Neill is uh, one of these individuals in Washington that is a big empresario of great ideas. So if you have a great idea or you think you have a great idea, run it by him and you'll go far. Um, since I started, uh, the book was, um, uh, published on March 5th of this year. Since then, I have given a lot of talks about the book. And it gets easier and easier. Uh, well, that day was a bit complicated. I was, the book was launching in New York, 
and I had a bunch of media appearances concerning the end of power. And that day, President Chavez decided to die. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and so uh, I went to speech the end of power, and everyone wanted to talk about the end of Hugo Chavez. <laughs> uh, but uh, that, all, that gave me uh, the, big, the, the start of what was going to come uh, since then. And since then, uh, I, it has, as I said, it has gotten easier to talk about the book. Because now all I do is to uh, invite the audiences to think about names or about concepts. So let me throw at you a, a, a few names and see what that means to you. Mohammed Morsi, Pope Benedict, The Washington Post, Edward Snowden, The Tea Party, The Taliban, Somali pirates, Kodak, Kodak is bankrupt. Um, and I could go on. And so you get the gist of this. These are all entities where power has changed, has changed hands, has transformed, but in no, not in the usual ways. Pope Benedict is the first pope to resign in 700 years. The Washington Post, do you imagine me coming here five years ago and telling you, you know, the Washington Post, which is one of the world's leading newspapers, is going to be sold to an internet guy. And the Graham family and everything else that, 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 that surrounds the, that, that, that institution uh, is going to go, and there is an internet guy. Not even the internet company. The owner of an internet guy just, you know, just wrote a check and bought it. By the way, um, he bought it for less money than uh, what AOL paid for the Huffington Post. Exactly $100 million less. So the Washington Post was sold for $100 million less than the Huffington Post, except that the, the assets of the Huffington Post were mostly intangible. And the, uh, the Washington Post did have uh, printing presses and buildings and stuff like that. So uh, the story of my book is a story of the mutation of power. Uh, there is one aspect of that story that is quite well uh, known to, to you. And that is power is shifting. There's no surprise there. You know that. You know that power is shifting from uh, North America and Europe uh, to Asia. Uh, you know that power is shifting from very large companies uh, uh, to recently arrived uh, uh, agile startups. You know that power is shifting from presidential palaces uh, to town squares. Uh, uh, and you know that in some places it's even shifting from men to women. Perhaps not as, as much as some of us would like it, but that, that too is happening. And, uh, but I argue that power is not just shifting, that there is something more profound uh, and more, trans more important happening, uh, and that is that power is decaying. So power may be shifting from A to B, but when what B gets is not as much as it was before or what uh, A, A had. Power is degraded. Uh, B can do less with that power than in the past. That doesn't mean that the world is not full of very powerful individuals and institutions. Vladimir Putin, that was just recognized by Forbes as the most powerful person in, in, on Earth, is surely very, very powerful. The Pentagon is a very powerful institution. The central bank, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the the European Central Bank and Mario Draghi are powerful institu individual institutions. So I'm not arguing that they don't have a power. I'm arguing that their power they have is more constrained, that they can do less with that power than in the past, that there are more restrictions to what they can do with it. And that in, in, in addition, that power is more fleeting, that people that have power um, have uh, uh, the, the, the time uh, span and, the, and, and the, 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 their tenure in power has become shorter. And, and moreover, I argue that this is not just happening in politics, but it's happening in business, it's happening in culture, in sports, in universities, in philanthropy, in labor unions, and wherever there is uh, organized human activity, where power matters, where something needs to get done, and in order to get it done, you need uh, uh, to coordinate and somehow organize and structure behavior, and therefore power is 
matters. Uh, wherever that happens as part of the human experience today, um, the power is decay. I, you know, perhaps the most extreme example and the most cl clear example of this is Mohamed Morsi. Again, if I would have been here a few years ago and I would have told you, you know what, Mubarak is going to be toppled. And then there's going to be an election. And the election is going to be won by uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. And, they, they're gonna, and then they're going to have an Egyptian president that is a, a, a member of the, of the Muslim Brotherhood. That would have not gone down. You know, a lot of you would have been, rightly so, very skeptic of that assertion. Well, it happened. Mubarak was toppled. There was an election. Mohammed Morsi won. Mohammed Morsi ended up in the palace. And he thought that he was Mubarak and that he had the same powers as Mubarak. And he was ousted in, what, two, two years or something like that. Uh, and so power is essentially has become easier to acquire, harder to use, and easier to lose. And that is the central theme of the book. Um, there are reasons for this. When I, the, the first instinct when people ask, well, why is this happening? The first instinct is, well, it's the internet, of course. It's social media. It's Twitter and Facebook and, and, and all the rest. And I disagree with that. Of course, those are tools that have amplified potential uh, interventions by individuals. These are tools that have created new opportunities. These are clearly tools that have uh, uh, altered the way power is used uh, and constrained. But those are tools. And tools have users, and users have direction and motivation. So far more important than understanding the tools is to try to understand what are the forces that drive the motivation and the directions of the users of those tools. And so what are those? The list is very, very long, but I grouped it in three categories uh, that I call revolutions. These are revolutions that are weakening, undermining, overwhelming the barriers that protect the powerful. In order to have power in a church, in a company, in, a, in, in an army, or in politics, you need to have some special assets that are hard to replicate by the challengers, by those that compete against you. Uh, and those assets, those unique assets, those unique barriers, those shields that protect the powerful and the incumbents from challengers and contestants have becoming easier to penetrate, easier to undermine, easier to circumvent <coughs> by the three revolutions. The first revolution I call the more revolution. And it tries to capture the fact that we now live in a world of more, in a more of profusion, in a world of, where profusion reigns. And I will give you some examples of that. But not just that we have more of everything, more people and more countries and more computers and more weapons and more philanthropists and more political parties and ideologies and more of everything. But the more that we have moves more. And that I group into a second category that I call the mobility revolution. Essentially, everything moves. Humans move more. We have more humans that move more. But money moves more, and ideas, and, 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 and products, and services, and information, and everything moves more. And the two together, the more and mobility, create a profound change in mentality, in aspirations, in expectations, in ways, in values. And the three of them weaken the barriers that, sh that, that protect the powerful. Uh, the essence of the story is one where there are, each one of these three revolutions has consequences for power. Uh, the more revolution overwhelms the barriers that protect the powerful. The mobility revolutions help them circumvent the barriers. And the mentality revolution undermines the barriers. Put them together, shake them, and you end up with a world where power is easier to acquire, harder to use, and easier to lose. Let me stop here and continue the conversation. Great. Perhaps. Excellent. Fantastic. Um, <clears throat> I'll start off with a few questions, and then um, we'll move to an audience Q&A. One of the things that struck me this uh, year and I think it's just uh, remarkable, is that in August, um, 
The United States was forced to press pause on diplomacy with 20 countries for five days. Normal visa services suspended U.S. citizen services in dangerous countries across uh, Africa and the Middle East were suspended. Trade talks, uh, political discussions, security discussions, all these things suspended across 20 countries for five days. It wasn't a country that induced the situation. It was a non-state actor, the leader of which made a phone call to another non-state actor, Al-Qaeda members in the Middle East and Africa. And that conversation and picking it up and the potential for an attack on a U.S. facility pushed pause on U.S. diplomacy. I think that is truly remarkable. Even when North Korea rattled its sabers over the last uh, couple of years, we didn't shut down 20 embassies across Asia for five days, right? But a guy making a phone call from Western Pakistan to the MENA region was able to do that. I find that remarkable. I'm wondering if you, if you think this is the uh, norm, and are uh, we re overreacting to these groups? Well, um, that belongs to the category of, uh, I think Tom Friedman coined the term, uh, he said, the super empowered um, individual or terrorist or something like that. Uh, and that is essentially that category in which you have either individuals or groups of individuals uh, that are non-state actors that have acquired mm -hmm. huge capabilities. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's one, um, mm -hmm. but you know, that we have the tragedy, you know, we have 9-11. 9-11 is estimated to have cost half a million dollars. And the consequences of 9-11 are $3.3 trillion and still counting, depending on how you count. But, so that gives you a, se a sense of proportion, right? It's, it's, but what's very interesting um, uh, about that is, you know, we, we have evidence of what you described on, uh, on, on, on a daily basis. You open the newspaper and you, sa you see mm -hmm. that uh, a, a, a small, tiny actor, sometimes an individual, uh, has changed things. So there is a category of that. But what's fascinating is how that uh, behavior cuts across all kinds of disciplines. Mm -hmm. So think about other examples that are quite interesting from other realms. I mentioned Kodak. Uh, who here doesn't have a Kodak moment? Right? Kodak was a company that for decades, perhaps even a century, dominated photography. If you wanted film, cameras, photography, pictures. Kodak was it. Kodak moment. Well, Kodak is now bankrupt. Kodak went out of business. Uncannily, at the same time that Kodak was going filing for Chapter 11, uh, a, a company was bought for a billion dollars. The company was in photography. The company had 13 employees, one, three, 13. I joke that, and it had three, it was three years old. And I joke that the, the average age was 13 of the employees. <laughs> uh, that company is uh, Instagram. And it was purchased by Facebook for a billion dollars. So com just compare and contrast. You have this giant company in Rochester, New York, that dominated the world of photography for uh, almost a century. That has, I'm not suggesting that Kodak went bankrupt because of Instagram. Kodak went bankrupt because of Kodak. Uh, but it was, uh, just think who replaced or who played, who became a very important player mm -hmm. uh, in, in that world. And we have evidence, as I said, you know, there's a f great story that I like very much. You, you've heard it, I'm sure. Um, there is this little 11 year old girl in England who went to school every day, and she hated the food in the cafeteria that she was fed. So she decided to start taking pictures every day of her lunch at school, and started a blog. And then started commenting, what is it that they were being, being fed? And other kids started doing the same, and the parents got involved. And it became a major issue, and, and therefore, and the public system, the, 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 the school system, had to change completely overhaul the way in which uh, food was served in public. So I, I'm trying yeah. to use very different examples to, to indicate how broad this trend is beyond the one that, that you mentioned. Th thank you, Moises. In, in the book, you mentioned that for every dollar Al-Qaeda spent for the 9-11 attack, the US has responded with $7 million for each dollar they've spent. I mean, that is, that is really remarkable. You mentioned the internet and the blogging, and the internet obviously is a tremendous uh, uh, part of this discussion. Cisco and other IT companies are pushing what's known as the internet of everything or the internet of things, where 
books, shoes, lights, all of the objects in our lives are connected via the internet where everyone has access to information, people know things about others, you know, an end to transparency, or, or I'm sorry, an end to secrecy in, in, in a, a new era of transparency. How might this also impact power structures when everyone has access to every piece of information or on the way to that point? In several ways, and that, I think the more honest answer that I can give is that I don't know. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, that a lot of people that study this would also agree that uh, this is a still a very in uncertain uh, future f for a lot of these things mm -hmm. because you know, it's the combination of new technologies but at the same time of new social demands. Uh, I think there is a building a huge appetite for uh, a user experience that is safer than what we have now. Every one of us at some point will be willing to pay some uh, money to have an experience in the internet where you feel a little bit more uh, safe and secure. That is going to create a very unequal internet. There's going to be the internet of the generics, of you know, the, 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 the high school student in India or in Ecuador that can access uh, the internet for free, more or less, and, and, and roam the internet. That individual is going to be exposed to a lot of risks. Yep. And then there is people that uh, the more money you have and the more money you are willing to invest, the more protected you are going to be. Uh, in, in the way you use the internet. And that will have huge consequences for the distribution of power. Mm -hmm. But we are not there yet, as mm -hmm. Angela Merkel can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, one, one final question before we open it up. And it's, I, I know you're saying it's not, uh, that traditional power structures are not losing their power. It's not a wholesale shift to non-state actors and other entities. Um, but as I, as I went through your book um, and as I look at the work that Arno and I uh, have done with, uh, with Dick and Ron and, and others, um, you know, lives are becoming more uncertain for a lot of people, complicated and threatening for, for quite a few people. So won't there actually be a trend, do you think, of people returning to power structures, safe harbors <clears throat> that they know of religion or governments? You know, in fact, turning away from this and saying, all of these non-state actors actually make me want to go to a status quo power. I don't think so. I think the appetite for that is there. I think the need for you know, people wanting to do it, governments that want to have to go back to the old ways in which they had less constraints is there. And, and companies uh, you know, who are hungry for uh, having more autonomy and less constraints, all of that is there. But I think that the forces that I describe in the book, uh, uh, some of them are irreversible. Uh, they have to do with demographics, they have to do with technology, they have to do uh, with uh, geopolitical realities that are now very deeply entrenched. And they are ha and having to do also with the mentality revolution where expectations have changed, values have changed. You know the University of Michigan has conducted the World Value Survey uh, now for 40, 50 years. Uh, and you, it, they just go out and, and, and survey values in a sample of countries that account, I think, for 85% of humanity. And when you look at the trend lines of how values have changed in the last 10, 15 years, it's quite amazing. Uh, and, uh, and, and it's a very different world of values. It's a different world of expectations. You have this, the global middle class, as you know, it's the fastest uh, growing segment of humanity. Uh, and this, that, that middle class creates all kinds of new realities uh, yeah. for, for power. And uh, so, yes, the appetite to, take, to go back to tribes, to go back to cocoons of safety, to go back to uh, governments that govern and that, you know, the strong hand that contains uh, anarchy and chaos, all, all of that, the demand for that is there and may be growing. But the capacity to do it, I think, has been very significantly undermined by trends that are not controlled by anyone. Yeah. Excellent. So we'll open it up to questions and please identify yourself and your affiliation if you do in fact have one. We'll start with Ron Marks in the front row here. Thank you, Moises. It's an interesting premise. I just want to run a historical comparison to see what you think. We've had periods of time, whether it was at the end of Rome, whether it was the end of the Catholic dominance in Western Europe, I mean obviously the Western civilization examples, 
we've had the end of, of certain of the empire period in the early 20th century, and now to some extent we're at the end of an industrial U.S. dominated business that started, I think, in, you know, really in 45 and beyond. Why does this trend necessarily differ from the other ones? We've had breakup of great power and then a coming together again of, of power under another in somewhat different circumstance. That's a great question uh, and a challenging one. And I, it's one that I had to think uh, hard about, you know, how, how much of what I'm describing is a, a, a passing uh, ephemeral uh, snapshot that will go back to the normal, which is what we had in the past. I am convinced, I don't know because it's a self-serving <laughs> conclusion, but I am convinced that no, that this time this is, this is indeed different uh, than the past for several reasons. First, many of the examples that you use to, to, to illustrate how this is another manifestation of the fragmentation of power that we have witnessed in the past, you know, with city-states and neo, you know, the, there is a whole school of thought which is the neo-medieval. Uh, you know, there's a, there are people that are writing and researching, uh, they call is, is the neo-medievalist approach, uh, in which essentially argue that the future looks uh, in many interesting ways like uh, the, the medieval times. Uh, I disagree with that, um, mostly because of the more mobility revolutions. If you think about some of the ex good examples you gave, they touched a tiny bit of him. First, we, there were very few of us. And, it, and, and those were uh, highly concentrated in geography. They happened in very specific places and did not spread too much. Uh, this is happening everywhere. And it's spreading at great speed. So some of the things that we, we're discussing is, you know, uh, a school in England, but at the same time, uh, uh, you know, so someone in Pakistan calling someone in Yemen. Uh, we are discussing things that are happening in Latin America, uh, in, in Capitol Hill and the Tea Party, uh, and with Kodak. And so what I'm arguing is that the trends that we're talking about are far more uh, global, in fact, and, um, and, and faster. Great. Yes, Arno in the front, and then this gentleman in the middle row. <clears throat> Thanks for a fascinating talk. One thing that troubles me more than anything right now is social media. We've gone from newspaper reading to Twitter in uh, just a few short years. People don't read newspapers anymore. Only older people do. Where does all this lead? Social media, what is the ultimate danger as you see it, or advantage as you see it? Again, uh, I think, Arnold, that uh, even the people that spend their lives trying to understand that on a daily basis, with t an honest answer to that question is we don't know. Uh, because it's changed, again, it's changing very fast. And there are all kinds, of, I was, I had the, the, the privilege of presenting the book and discussing it in Silicon Valley, and I went to several of the leading companies there. And when you hear what they have in store, you know, there is a whole wave of new technologies that are going to change our consumer behavior in terms of consumers of information and so on. And um, so there is that, first is that, you know, uncertainty about what's coming. But then there is, the, is, is that the social media consequences are good or bad for readers. Um, again, you're right that a lot of people now just communicate in, in very short uh, spurts. But on the other hand, I, I, I am an intensive user of Twitter. Um, and I now get uh, a lot of what I read, I read through Twitter. I don't follow the idiot that tells me, now I'm going to go drink. You know. <laughs> but I, I follow people that I respect and tell me, I have just read the best article about the Arab Spring for example. And then, and then I click and I go to an article in a journal or in a blog that I would have never gone uh, uh, on my own. So I, in social media and Twitter uh, can give you Sherpas that helps you navigate uh, this tsunami of information uh, that is so difficult uh, to understand. And then I think the mainstream media uh, are going to come up um, I am very curious to see what Jeff Bezos does with the Washington Post, and I can imagine that there are some interesting possibilities there 
emerging uh, a big brand uh, and good journalism with uh, you know, technological innovation. I like how you put that. The internet gives us Sherpas to navigate the tsunami of information. That's, that's superb. In the middle here. <clears throat> Bob Hold on. Hold on. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Bob Berg, World Academy of Art and Science. Um, some of my colleagues and I have also been to Silicon Valley where we're talking about the future of universities and libraries and the democratization of uh, higher education that's coming, which we have no idea what the political implications will be. Let me ask you a not unreasonable hypothetical. Let's say a modern major head of state says, okay, I see these changes. I'd like to take advantage of them in a new politics. What would you advise would be the new opportunities? I get that question uh, quite a bit, and I don't know the answer. Um, it depends on the head of state, and it depends on the circumstances. Uh, what I know is that uh, one of the main challenges for heads of state is lack of partners. Not inside of their government and inside of their party, but uh, in adversaries. One of the big problems that heads of states have is that their adversaries, their uh, opposition, their rivals are weak. <coughs> this is sound, may sound paradoxical, right? You know, if you, you, if you are a head of state, uh, having weak competitors is nirvana, right? You are the top uh, power uh, on the game. But that's not true. Ask President Obama if he would have not loved to have a stronger speaker. That, you know, Speaker Berner cannot deliver uh, the votes and the caucus in, in, in Congress. And President Obama would have been very, very interested in having a speaker that is uh, stronger and more powerful. Uh, or to have uh, partners uh, to deal with uh, Syria. That would have, you know, the, the reality in the Middle East is weakness everywhere. Who in the Middle East is powerful? Who? Iran, Iraq, Egypt, Turkey, the US, Europe. Who, who is strong there? Well, everyone has a little bit of power. No one has enough power to define the game. Frank Fukuyama coined a term that I think is very appropriate. Uh, he, 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 he was not talking about geopolitics. He was talking about national politics. He said that the democracies around the world today are becoming vitocracies, vitocracies, meaning that you have a profusion of political players, groups, or individuals that have the power to veto the initiatives of the majority or the, of the initiatives of those in power. So you have this proliferation of players. Each one has the capacity of raising the hand and says no or not like that, or let's postpone it, or let's water it down, or let's not do it. And, uh, and therefore, you end up with governments that are hobble giants, because they are surrounded by, by these actors that have, don't have the power to play, but have the power to stop the others from playing. And so that, I think, is one of the realities of President Obama and, 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 and others. Moises, uh, on that note, I would just read one brief line from your book on page 108, where you say in the chapter, the decaying power of large armies, while it is clear that today's micro powers cannot go toe to toe with the world's military powers, they are increasingly able to deny victory. And that, that I think reflects that comment. This man, woman here. Margaret Hayes with uh, Georgetown University. Um, Moises, in Illicit, in your last chapter, <laughs> where you address, how does one address uh, this, you argue that in order to deal with this profusion of power and opportunities for transactions, that governments are going to have to change from kind of a hierarchical way of thinking to thinking more like networks. And uh, I, I'd like you to, can you, have you changed that uh, posture uh, as, as you write this book? It seems, for instance, in disaster response and other areas, we are using networks to mobilize uh, social media to communicate with the public and, and so forth. Is, uh, is that 
the solution to the uh, end of power? It depends on, the, uh, that's a great question. And, uh, and um, I think it depends on what realm are you thinking? You know, are you thinking the private sector? Are you thinking government? Are you thinking the military, universities? There are some activities where, uh, that are more welcoming to operating with networks. And there are others in which you require hierarchies and power as, it, as we knew it. One of the concerns I have with networks is that now it has become fashionable. Um, in, in the 90s, I wrote um, something, a, a book, uh, that essentially argued that in the case of uh, reforms and development, uh, institutions matter very much. And that there were two stages of economic reforms, one in which you essentially change things by decrees and you, know, you devalued your, your currency, you uh, privatized. You could do those things with a stroke of a pen. And then there were other kinds of reforms that required building institutions that took longer, the political economy was more complicated, and it became, you know, institutions, and institution building became quite common as a, as, as a theme, which I now think was a mistake on my part, and I think it's a damaging uh, concept. Uh, because institution building has become a phrase that makes people feel or pretend that they know, and uh, we don't know. Uh, institution building is a word that uh, serves to, masks, to mask ignorance. And the reason I'm mm. talking about that is because with networks is happening. Wherever people, there, there are situations that people don't, don't understand, say, well, you know, networks. Let's do networks. Let's have a networked approach to this. Let's have, uh, you know, the network has, is now to, in, the, in the 2000s. Networks is what in the 90s was institution building. Whatever you don't know anything and you want to sound smart, talk about networks. Uh, and the problem with that is, of course, there are networks. Of course, we need to build institutions. Of course, we need to strengthen institutions. Of course, a lot of what's going on is the networking of what used to be hierarchies. The problem is, after you say that, there is not, there's not a lot more that we know. Networks are not the same. Networks are different. Networks have different configurations. Networks can behave in different ways. So our ignorance of going after the net, after saying that, yes, networks are important, when you scratch the surface of that assertion, there is not a lot of good knowledge there, reliable knowledge. There is a lot of buffering. The second row here. Josh, right here. Thanks. Peter Stevens, American University. M maybe critical realignment is now an obsolete description for the political process that it, that's occurring. If, if networks are the start but not the end by any means, um, would you say a few words about that? What, what is critical, critical realignment? Critical realignment where you have major swings in terms of domestic politics and sometimes there's spillovers globally and, and you know, liberal parties come in hold majorities, conservative parties come in, radical parties come in. It seems that, that that sort of movement back and forth is becoming more rapid and, as you pointed out, much more ephemeral. Yeah, that's, that's right. Uh, so, yes, uh, th there is, I, I don't know if it's critical realignment, is, is insurgencies. Uh, you know, I would call it that in a lot of places what you're seeing is insurgencies. The Tea Party is an insurgency against the Republican Party. You can even argue that the Tea Party is a hostile takeover of the Republican Party by a group of insurgents. Uh, and, in, in, and throughout Europe, uh, you see these new insurgent groups that are very critical of everything but have very little to offer. So the critical realignment, as you call it, is, a, is a huge on criticism and short on prescription. Uh, and that is a pattern that you will find in a lot of these movements that are very, very good at, at agitating, at steering, at uh, uh, mobilizing, but not that effective at prescribing. Networks and movements and that kinds of, uh, that, that, of energy are very good at, uh, at mobilizing people, are very bad at governing. Yeah. Yeah. Chris. Hi, Rob Levinson, Bloomberg Government. I, I guess I want to ask the sort of the normative question of is, is this a good thing or a bad thing? If you, if you think um, big, powerful institutions, militaries, governments, 
the religious institution, whatever, they, they do offer one thing, and it goes back to your point earlier about uh, security. They certainly offer security. And as their power erodes, in some ways we are less secure. I mean, it's, you know, anarchy is less secure than dictatorship and that kind of thing. So, so if that's a downside of sort of a, a, a lessening of security, what's sort of the upside of all of this, for, say, for individuals or different groups? You know, some obviously will benefit, others may not. Um, but what do you see as sort of the upsides of, of this kind of thing or the downsides? Thanks. So I was, I, I, I looked in the book, I wanted to show you a, ch a graph I have, which I call the inverted U curve. Uh, essentially, you have a, a U, an inverted U, a parable. Uh, where if you measure uh, social desirability of, you know, in, 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 the, in the horizontal, uh, you, you, you measure the decay of power, the concentration of power, or the spread of, of, of power. Uh, thank you. He knows the book better than I do. <laughs> uh, essentially, this is my way of saying that there is, there, in, in one extreme, there is a world of concentration of power, of dictators, of monopolists, of uh, uh, strong men, and all, all of that, which is not good for us. So we don't want power to be too concentrated. And so as you move and power becomes less diffused and there's more competition, it's better for society. So if you measure benefits to society, you go up. But then there is a point that you identified where more of that is bad for society because it, le it, it leads to, to you know, anarchy and, uh, and the difficulty of making, making decisions and vetocracies and all of that. So, I am all for, I don't care about the hyper diffusion of power in the private sector. Let them compete. The more competition there is, the better. Uh, but there is, there are, and, and so there is a lot that is good in the, in, in, the, in the trends that I described here. This is a world of opportunity. This is a world of possibility. This is a world in which a few people can get together and create huge changes. This is a group where uh, 11-year-old uh, in England can change things where uh, people can take to the streets and, and, and topple a tyrant. So it, it, there's a lot of very good is it, groups that have been marginalized now have a, a shot at, 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 you know, at a seat at the table. So it is a lot of good that it's going on uh, that I think we, we need to welcome and applaud and, and, and promote. But then there is the downside uh, of, of the curve where more of that creates gridlock. Governments that cannot decide, decisions that are postponed, decisions that are watered down. And that is the, the, the part of politics that I think ought to worry us. And so I think that one of the implications of what I'm saying is that in democracies, we need to restore a little bit of power uh, on those that have power. Mm. Essentially, what ha what's happened, one of the secular trends that we, you know exists is the decline of trust around the world everywhere, trust on others, on institutions, of governments is declining. Because trust is declining, democracies have replaced lack of trust with more checks and balances on those that have power. You don't trust people that have power, so you constrain their power. That's happened in the United States. And so we are, oh, we are overdosing on checks and balances to the point in which governments, uh, to the point in which we vi witnessed the spectacle that we witnessed uh, all these past weeks with um, the, in Capitol Hill and everything else. So I do believe that there is a need for uh, restoring a little bit of power in while, while maintaining democracy and transparency and accountability, but I think we have gone overboard in constraining the power of elected officials. Yep. Back row with John. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm John Glenn with the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition. This has been really stimulating. You've obviously put your finger on something. Can I ask one way to further the conversation is, in addition to the notion that power might be decaying or diffusing, how do you think power is changing today? I mean, obviously, here at CSIS, I can't help but think about the Smart Power Commission that they hosted here. But I mean, there's certainly a notion that there are certain kinds of power let's talk about the hard power, soft power dichotomy perhaps, is one that's no longer to be able to accomplish certain things that we thought. The nature of global threats is changing. You can't use a military to solve a pandemic. 
But at the same time, so there's different kinds of power that are effective. I imagine this is a question you've been asked before. I'd be interested in your thoughts. Yeah, that's a, and it's a, it's a tough one because, again, it depends on where. Where are you, you know, power where? In the Vatican or in the Pentagon? Uh, in the, at Harvard or uh, at uh, AFL-CIO? In all of those places, uh, power is, is changing more or less in the ways I, I'm describing. Uh, the, the, and, and we need to, to differentiate between the tools of powers and the, and, and the actual use uh, and, and possibilities of the tools. There's no doubt that hard power exists. There's no doubt that soft power exists, hard to measure and everything else, but it's there. You, you know the allure of, uh, of a nation uh, certainly has uh, some, some uses. But what is happening is that in, in, in both cases, uh, it is more constrained and it's harder to use. And, uh, and um, there, are, there is a very interesting conversation about how do you live and prosper in a world like this? Uh, and and, and how, what does it mean for leadership? And, um, and you know, what does it mean to lead an organization? Uh, where weakness is more common than, 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 than strength. Next question, yes. Third row, please. <clears throat> Hugh Schwartz. Uh, your thesis, the end of power, is pretty convincing, although there is a question of whether it is temporary. Um, at the same time which this seems to be taking place, in the United States and in a number of other countries in the advanced world and in the middle income countries of the world, the upper one tenth of one percent of the population have increased in the last decade their holdings of income and wealth. Uh, are these two things inconsistent or is, um, is the latter a reflection of the fact that power as we've defined it traditionally is, is mistaken? and it has to be redefined. And then we would find it that it, uh, there has not been a diminution in power. So when I was writing the book, um, I had two paralyzing thoughts yeah. as I was you know, in front of my computer writing. One is that I was writing about power. And just pick, you know, put yourself in the shoes of someone that wakes up in the morning and says, now I'm going to write a book about power. <laughs> You see, I very often I felt like an idiot. I felt like it was, you know, uh, uh, what can I say about power that has not already been said? This is one of the great themes about which everyone has written. So that was a very paralyzing thing that I needed to. <laughs> and the second is, not only am I going to write about power, but I'm going to say things that run against the current. Because the, the, the common wisdom is that power is concentrating. Why? Because of what you said. Uh, because income and, and uh, wealth are concentrating and because power is money and money is power. If money is concentrated, capital and wealth are concentrating, therefore power is concentrating. And I'm arguing the contrary. And your question is excellent and is one of the questions that I, I had to grapple with. So uh, the first one is about writing about power, I decided that if I wanted to write about power, it had not, I, I should not write opinions. I should really, really collect uh, as much data and as much persuasive evidence and apply to it the best social science uh, available, the leading edge thinking uh, in terms of the social sciences and see what that showed and let the numbers and, uh, do the talk about power. And, and, and so that was my way of uh, overcoming uh, the, the overwhelming fear of writing about that big subject. And the second is uh, that, again, um, the notion that uh, concentration of wealth and income would lead to the concentration of power uh, is, I, I found that that's not true. And the book has a lot of evidence. I, I tackled that issue very directly because it's there. If you think about the private sector, uh, you know, perhaps the most extreme example in the private sector is the financial sector. After the financial crisis, uh, a lot of uh, bank and financial intermediaries went bankrupt or were taken over by larger institutions, and f about five of them uh, concentrated a huge amount of the portfolio of the assets in the United States. JP Morgan, HSBC, Wells Fargo, uh, and uh, uh, others. 
Goldman Sachs, of course. And then you look at what happened. So these are the masters of the universe now. Lloyd Blankfein and Goldman Sachs uh, and uh, uh, Jamie Dimon uh, at JP Morgan and Bob Diamond at Barclays, which is another of the big banks that came on top. Barclays took over Le Lemon. Lemon became, you know, the, the good assets of Lemon became part of, of Barclays. Well, Bob Diamond, who led that, is out of, jo out of a job. He was fired uh, just a, a, a few years later. Uh, Jamie Dimon, as we speak today, is confronting a super challenge by regulators all around the world. Uh, and the, uh, the last number that was thrown around was a fine of $13 billion. And that was not just the, the last of his, uh, of his problems. Uh, each one of the big banks is now limited in ways that it was not before. Am I arguing that Jamie Dimon and Lloyd Blankfein are not powerful? Of course not. They are but they can do less than they were able to do before, even though they now concentrate a lot more of assets. And the statistics <coughs> bear this out. Uh, I cite in the book, the research that shows that a company that was in the, tw in the top 20% of its sector in 1980 uh, had, um, I think, 20% probability of falling out of that category five years hence. As time went by and that research was replicated, the probability that companies at the top of their league would get out of that uh, would be, uh, have, have increased. Turnover rates uh, of CEOs of the 2,500 uh, <coughs> largest companies in the world have skyrocketed. It is now very unsafe to be uh, a CEO of a very large company. You get fired more often than ever. Still, you have the, the, the great life and the, the, the planes and the, the office and the, the salaries and all that, but it's more fleeting. You last lo less, uh, you, it's not as long, uh, the tenure in power of the, of the CEOs. Um, and there's a whole list of factors that are affecting um, the, the, the wealth. And so, of course, wealth buys, buys power, but less than before. Moises, when you look out at, at institutions, status quo powers, nations, in light of what you've written, but also just in light of what you've seen recently since you published the book, what institutions or countries or other status quo power entities do you think have a short shelf life? China. China. So there is um, a study that uh, someone is initiating and talking. <clears throat> you know, someone got very interested in the book and decided to measure the three revolutions more mobility and uh, mentality and apply, you know, they develop something like 60 variables uh, for each one of them that measures these things. And then they rank countries uh, uh, as to which countries were uh, more prone, are going to be more prone to important changes in power as a result of the intensity of these three revolutions. And, and the research is still ongoing and it's just actually not ongoing, it's beginning. Uh, but some preliminary numbers on the back, you know, back of the envelope uh, show that you know, some of the countries are going to, ex that, think about China, you, know, it's, it's actually don't need, you don't need an econometric <coughs> model, right? <coughs> think about the more revolution, the more of everything <coughs> is going on in China. Yeah. The more of everything that moves is going on in China. And very profound changes in expectations, aspirations, and values is going on in China. So if you put all that together, and you believe that those things have consequences of power, then the corollary is it's hard to imagine that, that the current status quo can yeah. be sustained in China for the next decade or two. And in fact, you know, Ming Xinpei uh, is a colleague of mine, a friend of mine, who I regard as one of the top sinologists in the world, uh, who's very well informed. <coughs> he argues, and he has a paper that, you know, there is a lot of now academic papers. Uh, that are coming out uh, doubting that uh, the current system uh, th that now uh, is in place, the government uh, uh, in, in China, can be sustained. That doesn't mean that it's going to move from what we have now with the Politburo and everything else. It's not going to move from that to switch to, to a Canton system of democracy and referendums. Uh, but that, that what it means, and I am convinced, is that the current way of governing China is going to be very hard to sustain. Uh, in the next de decade or two. Uh, that reminds me of a <clears throat> term you used in the book, which I think was great, which was contact breeds aspiration. 
And I, that's a great, great uh, term to apply to China. All the way in the back. Okay. Um, Moses, I look forward to reading your book, Tom DeQuino from Canada. I wonder what you say in your book about um, obviously the democratizing benefits of um, uh, what we might call the new form of consumerism, or at least uh, with all of this mobility, many more, many more people being beneficiaries uh, as uh, power centers are broken up. Um, but and I know you've I, and I know you've expressed concern about. Um, how far this goes before it tips into total anarchy. One of my concerns is the following. Uh, good public policy is often not driven by the mob, and good public policy is not often driven by political leaders, whether they be autocrats or elected, simply giving people what they want. What do you say in your book about the um, impairment uh, or the undermining of good public policy, which is essential uh, in terms of uh, good governance. So there, there is a whole section in the book uh, titled Terrible Simplifiers. The terrible simplifiers are the people that told uh, us that uh, internet companies without revenues ought to be valued at billions of dollars. Uh, terrible simplifiers are the likes of Hugo Chavez and his successors that promise uh, economic policies that we know uh, don't work, and yet they man manage to sell them to the public. Um, terrible simplifiers are people that argue that the United States budget can be, uh, the, the issues there can be solved with numbers that don't add up, but somehow are, uh, you know, managed to, to get a hearing and, and become respectable commentators where the numbers are patently false. So terrible simplifiers is part of the uh, new breed of uh, problems that we have, which is uh, uh, in a population that is full of anxiety, uh, confused, uh, uh, threatened, uh, a middle class that feels that it's losing ground, uh, the, 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 the appetite to listen to terrible simplifiers is there. So what I say in the book about what to do about it is to bring back an institution that is rarely mentioned in conversations like this, and that is political parties. When I go to colleges, and I, 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 I like to ask them, uh, I'm, I'm launching a new NGO that is trying to save a butterfly in Indonesia that is a, in, you know, is a danger of extinction. How many of you would like to join me in saving this butterfly in Indonesia? Inevitably, several hands, you know, they, they're ready. They're ready to go. They're ready to help the, save the butterfly in Indonesia. Then I explained this, and I don't know anything about butterflies. I made it up. Uh, it doesn't exist. I was just testing your willingness uh, to help, to do good, to help others. So now let me ask you a different question. I am going to join a political party. Let's decide on which one, and we'll join the political party. And they run for the exits. You know, <laughs> They don't want to know about political parties. <laughs> this is my way of explaining how, in the last 20 years or more, political parties have had a terrible run. And NGOs have had a great run. So if you're a young idealist individual, you don't join a political party. You join an NGO. And, and that's bad. Not joining the NGO, but not joining the political parties. And of course, there are very good reasons to be um, not to join political parties and reject them. They are corrupt, they are old, they are slow moving, they attract the wrong kind of people, they, they are exclusionary, they, you know, the, long, the list of why political parties, you know, people abhor political parties everywhere is there. Yet we need to change that. And political parties need to modernize, need to learn from NGOs and become more like NGOs. Uh, but retain uh, a lot of what political parties, the functions of political parties have been lost. Why am I saying this? Because political parties can be an, an antidote to the terrible simplifiers. Good. Front row here. Uh, Bill Tucker. Uh, 
I worked in the Reagan administration, and I've done, I've done a lot of work uh, in uh, China. And uh, I'd like your comment and reaction on China's uh, one-child policy. I've, uh, I've been an observant of this uh, over a period of years, and I have seen incidences where there's uh, the parents, two sets of grandparents, and uh, where the with a child in a department store that wants something that the parents won't buy for them or the grandparents, and the child is on the floor throwing a tantrum. And there are six, I mean, yeah, six adults that are so, oh, 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 you know, to try to please this, this child. And that's opposed to this older age in China that has worked all their lives uh, to build the country, and they really have no social security as we have in our country to support this older generation. And, and, and yet they are, are producing this younger generation that are, are spoiled brats, frankly, and do not want to work, and do not want to work as the older generation has, especially uh, to build the country. And what effect that's gonna have on China. I know that there are several books and articles that have discussed uh, uh, the consequences of the one child uh, policy. Uh, per one child per family policy. Uh, they range, the consequences range from uh, the psychodynamic behavior inside the family uh, to very large macroeconomic consequences uh, in terms of saving rates, in terms of social security, and even in terms of, uh, uh, the, because that I think there's an additional thing there, and that is, uh, I think Amartya Sen might, might have studied that, which is, uh, there are a lot of those, there's a disproportionate amount of men. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a whole uh, bunch of cohorts of females that are not there. Uh, and that creates, uh, of course, uh, a very significant problem that uh, probably is going only to be solved by migration. But again, it's, it's a huge subject for uh, which I am not an expert, yeah. but I know that it's a huge, ex uh, it's yeah. a huge subject. Yeah. Yes, in the middle here, and then another one. <coughs> uh, my name is Herman. I'm, I'm a member of uh, National Press Club in Washington and correspondent for Compass Daily in Jakarta. Uh, you mentioned also the seat of power from men to women. And I understand it has been taking place for decades in some countries, like in the Philippines, president, in Latin America, president, in Indonesia even, woman president. My question is that, why in the United States the process of uh, being lead, led by woman president or female president is very hard to take place? Do you have any prediction for years to come? United States be led by female president. Well, Thank you. So you are asking about Hillary Clinton <coughs> and, uh, and her potential. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's, but but uh, what I was saying about the shift of power uh, for men to women uh, did not just have uh, the numbers uh, of uh, leaders of heads of state or, or heads of governments or CEOs or member of boards. If you look at the numbers there, they're hugely un un underrepresented. Uh, the other day I was reading the, the central banks. The, there are 182 central banks in the world. Only 17 are led by women. So wherever you see uh, large institutions, uh, you see that women are underrepresented by uh, astounding, but huge numbers. But that is changing. And I don't, I'm not looking at the big uh, institutions, I'm looking at society. Uh, when I was researching the book, I found two factoids and statistics that I thought were fascinating. Divorce rates in India are skyrocketing among the elderly initiated by the woman. That means, that if they are the elderly, that means that, of course, these are marriages that have been going on for 30, 40 years. And therefore, there are arranged marriages. Now, the women are walking out of those marriages <coughs> in large quantities. That is a shift of power. That, is, that, that tells you something about what's happening to power. And I think the reason why this is happening is because they are more empowered, they're no more, they are, you know, the three revolutions apply there. Uh, they see more, they now are more prosperous, they have the resources, they have the opportunities, and the mentality revolution is there. Uh, and another similar um, survey also saw, sh sh discovered the same was happening, surprise, surprise, in the Gulf countries. 
where also divorce rates initiated by the women are now uh, much higher than they were. So it's that kind of shifts uh, that are quite important, uh, I think. And it's those shifts in the, at, the, at the essence of, of society, at the family, that eventually will pave the way for more changes at the top, and vice versa, of course. Yep. Back to the middle. Hello, I'm Ian Strom of the Advanced Technical Intelligence Center. So in uh, 2010, in the Egyptian Revolution, uh, the Mubarak government shut off the internet and the telephones for a couple of days or so to inhibit uh, the, the uh, planning of protests. I'm wondering how else might governments push back against uh, advancing means of communication and capabilities uh, to you know, tr try and stop um, students, uh, rebels, um, corporations, criminals, or terrorists from uh, decaying their power? Yeah. There is more and more of that. Uh, you know that uh, there was all these th thoughts and, and books and articles about the internet becoming a liberation technology. The technology that was going to be used to free, to fight for freedom. Uh, and, uh, and we saw a lot of that in the Arab Spring. But we also have seen the contrary. Uh, in Iran, for example, uh, the government and the intelligence services uh, use quite effectively uh, tracking uh, SMS messages and uh, other, you know, Twitter and everything else to identify where are, wh who were the nodes of the groups of people that were protesting, who were the central people that said, let's meet at this, ta this town square at 3 o'clock on Sunday. And so they would go to them directly. They would, that would help them uh, uh, target them more uh, effectively. And a lot of them ended up in jail. So side to side to the uh, huge potential that uh, the IT technologies have in uh, uh, helping people that are contesting governments, there is also governments are not uh, technological uh, dummies. Now they do have the technologies also to use those to, to to, to shield them from, from those attacks. Over here on the left. Thank you. Hi, Noelle Schroeder, Women Thrive Worldwide. You mentioned earlier that these shifts in power can allow the marginalized better access to a seat at the table, but that that also means that those decisions made at that table could be watered down. And I'm wondering if you can speak to the idea of how that might compare and contrast with the idea that this also gives those marginalized players, for example, civil society, better ownership of those decisions that are being made. For example, at the global level and setting the post-2015 development agenda through the United Nations. So, um, sure, there is, uh, we, we have evidence, right? We have now uh, almost 20, 30, 20 years of evidence about the resurgence of the, uh, the, you know, the surge of civil society and aspects of civil society has now gone global. And you can mobilize a lot of energies at the global level, uh, at, the, at the service of some, some causes. One of the initial examples that everyone used all the time and became a cliche was uh, uh, landmines and how civil society mobilized. And in fact, I think they won the, the, the organization, the civil society organization, and Mrs. Powell, I think was her name that led that, won the Nobel Peace Prize uh, for that. So that was one of the early, most visible uh, examples of the trend uh, that, that you mentioned. So there has been more of that. And I think there is more of that than, and, and more. And, and, and I think there's a lot to welcome uh, that with one caveat, and that it's very easy to miss the f reality that a lot of this, what we call civil society, that it has good sounding, non-governmental organization, even better sounding, in fact, are interest groups. Very focused, very single issue, very mm -hmm. able to ignore everything else. So if you worry about butterflies in Indonesia, that's your thing. You don't have to worry about uh, how the people in Indonesia in that area make a living. That's not your problem. Your problem is save the butterfly. 
Uh, and so, yes, there is a lot to applaud and welcome and, 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 and promote civil society, but let's not lose sight that these are interest groups. And that's where you hope you will have political parties that don't have the luxury of just worrying about one issue, landmines mm -hmm. or, or uh, uh, butterflies in Indonesia or poverty. Political parties need to have an opinion about the exchange rate and about nuclear weapons about agriculture and pre-kindergarten education. They have to have an opinion about everything. And you don't get that by joining an NGO that has just one very important, very desirable goal, but gives you a tunnel vision that allows you to ignore other aspects of, um, that, are, that need attention. Okay. Other questions? Yes, in the back. <coughs> Hi, Genevieve Severson with the Heritage Foundation. You mentioned earlier kind of Twitter Sherpas, and one thing I kind of worry about is people curating the internet for themselves and kind of shutting them off from other things they're not interested in. Do you see that as a danger, and how do you think it can be combated in order to unify people over a broad range of issues in a political party? Yeah, that's a huge, a huge question, a, quick, a huge problem, a huge question. You're right. One of the big issues is uh, you know the balkanization, the fragmentation of information on the internet and the fact that we only read uh, people that we like uh, their opinions. So tribes just read members of the tribe. And so you, uh, and you sometimes just speak at what the enemy is uh, tweeting or saying or blogging, but just a little bit to just immediately go back and look at what does a member of your tribe say about that. And so that creates very, very limited uh, ranges of conversations. And that limits you know, the proverbial conversation at the water cooler uh, at the office, where we all go there in the morning and we have all read at least one article uh, that uh, creates a shared conversation, even though we belong to different tribes. So that's a big issue. Uh, and uh, I, I don't think we have an answer to that. Arno, make this our final question. In my lifetime, the world population has gone from two to seven billion. Uh, in Tom's lifetime, it'll go well over 10 billion. How do you see this population explosion impacting everything we've heard here this morning? Right, it's huge, it's very important. Uh, it's part of my more, it's a very important part of the more revolution and um, you see, <laughs> Binyev Brzezinski uh, uh, has said that it's easier to, these days, it's easier to kill 100 million people than to govern 100 million people. Uh, there are issues of scale when you govern. Uh, there are issues, you know, it's, how do you <coughs> govern uh, 2 billion people uh, or more? And, and so that has consequences for power that are huge. And then, of course, there is the issue of... Uh, the uneven distribution of population. So yes, we're going to be more, even though UN uh, uh, predictions indicate that at some point it's going to flatten and even come down. So it's not, there are reasons to believe that those demographic trends will not continue to grow, but stabilize and decline. But still at a very, at very at significantly high numbers, nine, 10 billion people on Earth. But those 10 billion people are unevenly distributed. And so you have uh, places like Russia, as you know, uh, or Italy, uh, where, where population, in fact, uh, is, is declining. And uh, or the United States, or Jap not to mention Japan. Um, uh, and then uh, you have other places in the world uh, where um, population is, of course, booming, Africa. And so that, that in itself creates all kinds of consequences for power, the dynamics in the world. Great. Moises, over the last two days I was out of town giving a presentation uh, called Global Threats and Trends, and your book figured prominently in, in a lot of that. It's an incredible tool for business, for government, for citizens, for scholars, for a lot of different communities, and uh, I think it dovetails so well with our program here. And uh, I'd like to take this uh, moment to thank you on behalf of everyone here and a wider audience for providing such an important tool and resource for all of us. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>